words at the moves. Like it has for over four decades, Sesame Street has a stable of celebrities helping teach preschoolers. Uh, uh, Mr. Seth has something on his head. <laughs> <laughs> but executive producer Carol Lynn Parente, with help from Cookie Monster and Elmo. This looks like a job for the shape of bots. Says the focus this season is on a STEM curriculum for science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's the perfect curriculum for preschoolers because it's about asking questions. They do that anyway. They do that anyway. Yeah. Investigating. They do that anyway. Yeah. Observing. They do that anyway. Yeah. And experimenting. Sure. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, let's let's give a very warm welcome now to Carolyn Parente. Thank you. My goodness, I couldn't be more thrilled to be here today. Most of you are familiar with my colleagues, Cookie Monster and um, Elmo. But um, not everyone is familiar with Sesame Workshop, the organization that produces Sesame Street. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a background in that we're actually a, not pro a non-profit organization. So, um, you know, we sell a lot of products and um, have lots of fun content, but not a lot of people realize that we are an educational organization, first and foremost, and uh, a not-for-profit. And what we do is combine Media, Muppets, and put that together with the third M, the mission. And our mission is to help kids learn and grow, think, dream, and discover, basically reach their highest potential. So how do we do that? Well, this model you see um, in front of you has actually been our model for content creation from the very beginning. It is uh, a unique model and one that brings together writers, producers and researchers, and they all intersect to create this content. And so that little Sesame Workshop model center where everything intersects is where it can get a, a little ugly. Um, everyone is very passionate and, and uh, has strong opinions, and that's actually the role of a producer, is to sort of mediate that center and make sure that we have content that is equally entertaining and educational. And um, it really is a magic formula, one that has not been duplicated very much um, in the 42 years since we started. The other important part of that intersection is the writing on two levels, which some people just think we create a show that appeals to kids and adults. We actually do that by design and from the very first season because we're an educational organization, and in fact, we know that any educational messages we attempt to teach are um, received better with deeper impact when there's parent co-viewing. So that's been part of the design from the very beginning. Um, Sesame Street has always had what we call a whole child curriculum. And so you can see there's a lot of curriculum on that page. Um, this is about preparing kids for preschool but also for life. And we attempt to cover, now not every one of those subjects is, is um, covered in every show, but throughout the course of a season and our hour-long episode, we try and hit as many of those curriculum goals as we can. So within this framework, which you can see is very broad, we like to pick one curriculum focus every year that allows us to go a little bit deeper. And so um, the way we, pick that need is by bringing in, we, we assess, and it's sort of interesting, most people don't realize that Sesame Street started off as sort of a, um, uh, an experiment of itself, right, to see whether television could be used to teach. And that experimental nature of the show has lived on for all of our 42 years. So every year we look at the life of a preschooler and decide what the critical needs are and we select one of those for the season. So once we select that need, then we bring in academic advisors in that specific curriculum goal, and also experts in early childhood education, and they help us figure out what is the best way to teach that particular curriculum goal to these very young learners. And so the process in the circle goes on where we set those objectives, and it's important in that curriculum seminar, what we take out of that, you know, the, the, the academic advisors will say a lot of important things about what we should do, what we should teach. 
And there's only so much we can do as a media company, right? So there are some goals that we can't tackle because we can't be effective in teaching that in the world of media. So we absorb from the curriculum seminar those goals that we think we can have an impact on. And then we go off and take overlap our circles and duke it out and create really great scripts. And then once that goes on the air and kids are watching it, every season is, uh, ends with summative evaluation so that we can see how well we're teaching what we set out to teach. And we use the results of that, hopefully, to do better next time. And so for season 42, what we decided was that critical need was STEM. And why did we pick STEM for preschoolers? Well, American students are falling behind our peers at an alarming rate. In fact, if you look at these, um, these rankings from 2006, the US ranked 25 in math scores and 24 in science, something that um, is alarming and a trend that, um, as was previously mentioned, is not getting any better. In fact, we know from our very own focus groups that the workshop has done that there is this stigma about math and science. And the scary part is the stigma isn't just there with the students, it's there with their parents. And so the cycle sort of um, repeats itself. And so uh, in 2009, President Obama launched the Educate to Innovate campaign, which was promoting a renewed interest in STEM education. And the goals of this program were to increase STEM literacy so children can learn deeply and think critically in STEM, to help those rankings and move us back up um, more than a few notches, and also to exp expand STEM education and career opportunities for those underserved, particularly girls, which you've also heard mentioned today. And so Sesame Street sort of felt uniquely poised to uh, address this situation. One, because we start, we know we've been successful over our years of instilling a love of learning at a very young age. And we also happen to have as part of our strongest mission those underrepresented. And so we thought this was a calling that we should take on. <clears throat> now some said STEM for preschoolers, really. It's an awfully weighty subject for such young kids, and, and as I said in my NBC uh, part of the press tour, is when you actually break STEM down, what you learn is it's perfect for preschoolers. In fact, this is how they navigate their world. They observe, they ask questions, they experiment, they fail, they try again, and that's what uh, STEM is all about. And so we asked our writers, um, who are the best writers in the business? Um, I might add, they pay me to say that extra. Um, and two, those writers go off in a development room and you hear lots of noise and, and laughing sometimes and they eat a lot of food. And, um, and all the f catering food bills are well worth it because at the end of the day, you come up with some some pretty genius stuff, and um, they had a superhero to their rescue in this development session, and that superhero was Super Grover, everyone's lovable furry blue monster, with a little bit of a technology upgrade, hence the 2.0. So um, for those of you that don't know the Super Grover character, um, he isn't an obvious choice as a STEMist, which is a word, I don't know if we coined it or not, but we call Grover our STEMist. Um, his problem-solving skills are unorthodox, I guess I would say. Um, in fact, in several attempts, he, he rarely succeeds in his first few times out. And then when you start to think about STEM, you realize, well, lo and behold, he is the perfect representative for STEM because science is actually more about failure than success. And so Super Grover is a new format. It's a seven minute long format It's called Super Grover 2.0. And he takes on some pretty big problems dealing with things like ramps and pulleys, levers, wedges, even force. And these manifest themselves in um, some interesting questions, so uh, which you'll see some of them up there. Uh, for instance, how can birds get a baby grand piano into their nest? 
Well, the big idea there is about pulleys make it easier to lift heavy objects. So let's take a look at Super Grover in action. What's going on? This giant block of ice is right in the middle of our dance floor. Wee. I just gotta get over this wall. I just gotta. Well, we need help. Help! Help somebody help! Observation. I observe with my super eyes that you have fluffy flappers. I observe this piano is heavy! I cannot observe a thing with this giant block of ice in the way. The giant ice block is the problem. Be right back. <gasps> What's he going to do? This will do the trick. A spatula? A bowling ball? A whole poker mobile. Super Grover 2.0. 